G'day guys, how are we going? Look, I've been traveling Victorian high country now for well over 40 years. And over that time, I've got to understand the Victorian high country and what makes this place tick. So I'm going to put together a video here with a bunch of helpful tips and hints to help you guys out for when you next come down the Victorian high country. So we're going to stack to get through, grab a coffee, get comfortable, and let's go and see what the modern Victorian high country is all about. Well, just before we get started, I thought I'd give you a bit of an insight on how big the Victorian high country is, because it is huge. Now, just the Alpine National Park, that's about 650,000 hectares, and that is massive. And then you've got the State Park, which is sort of in amongst all there, that's another 250,000 hectares. So we're talking nearly a million hectares in the Victorian high country. It is a fantastic place, and certainly well worth coming down to have a look at. But it is one of these areas that never ever take this place for granted and always treat it with a great deal of respect. Okay, tip number one, where to find some helpful information about the Victorian high country. And the Parks Victoria website is a great place to start. Because on there you'll find a good list of the tracks that are open and what's not. And even during the times when the gates open in Melbourne Cup weekend in November through to Queen's birthday weekend in June, you know, we get some really harsh weather conditions down here and sometimes there'll be extended closures on those tracks or even midway through the season they can sometimes close tracks down for safety because of those harsh weather conditions. So don't always assume tracks are going to be open just because it's that time of the year. So have a good look on their website and make sure that tracks are open for the ones that you plan to drive. Another little tip I'll give you here, if I'm going to an area I've not been into for a while, I'll often ring that Parks Victoria office that's in that area and have a chat with the rangers there because look these guys are on the ground all the time and I've always found them really helpful for the information that I'm after whether it be about the weather, rivers, you know track conditions, all those sort of things. Those guys are really really helpful and well worth having a quick chat to that's for sure. I suppose then you just have a chat to some locals and they might give you a few tips as well. So there's tip number one we'll move on to the next one. So tip number two how do you stay informed on weather conditions while you're out in the Victorian high country and the best way that I have found is by tuning into the ABC radio 774 on the AM station and that's another reason why I put this long aerial on here because it gives me great coverage anywhere in the Victorian high country and it's the best way I've found for staying up to date with the weather total fire band days and all those sort of things so there you go there's tip number two well tip number three when is the best time to come down and visit the Victorian high country? Well, for me, any time of year is a great time of year because I just love the place, can't get enough of being up here. But for you guys, if you might be coming down from interstate, you know, so it's a long way to come down. So you want to make sure that you come down at those best times of year to give you the best opportunity to travel through the high country and check out all those amazing sites. So what I'm going to do here is We'll start with when the gates open, so that's the first Thursday before Melbourne Cup weekend in November, and then we'll talk about each month as we go through to when the gates close again, so that's the first Thursday after Queen's birthday weekend in June. Now, November is one of those very hit and miss sort of times of the year, I reckon. Anything can sort of happen from wind, rains, um, get a few hot days here and there. Daylight savings is now well in, so that's a good thing because you know, you've got the longer days. But it's not uncommon also that time of year to get a bit of snow happening. Um, and then you get into December. Now, December's a little bit the same as November, but you get start to get a few more warmer days. Um, but again, the snow's not uncommon, sort of mid to late December. It's generally somewhere around Christmas time it snows up in this uh, amazing part of the world. But, you know, so you've got to sort of be prepared for that sort of thing as well. Um, then you get into January and February, well they are our hot times of the year and don't worry we do get some hot times of year down here in Victoria believe it or not but we do. Um, so those times of year are generally hot and dry, um, could be a few bushfires going on so you need to be aware of that sort of thing going on with that time of year. Now for the primo time of year it's got to be all of March and sort of that early to mid April is the best time so you sort of got about a six or seven week window there. Daylight savings is still going, so that is a beautiful time. So you've got your longer days going on. The temperatures are generally around sort of that high 20s to maybe the odd low 30s every now and then. Really, really nice time of year, good climate. Weather's generally pretty good. Not a lot of rain sort of happens at that time of the year. So that gives you great opportunities to, you know, travel through the high country and check it all out. Then when you get into um, May and June, particularly May, well, May's a bit like November, I reckon. It's very hit and miss, but now the days are a lot cooler. 
Um, daylight savings is now finished, so we don't have that uh, that uh, luxury of having those longer sunny, warmer days and that sort of thing. So you need to take that into account with coming down in May, and generally you get a fair bit of early snowfall. So anything going to happen sort of that mid to late May, coming into June, where the snow season officially kicks in, and the gates in the high country shut, as I say, that first Thursday just after Queen's birthday weekend in June. And then we, as locals down here, we get all excited when that snow starts falling because that's camping out in the snow and doing that crazy stuff that a lot of people you know, probably don't get used to doing. But we just love it and we can't wait for that snow season to kick in. So I hope tip number three helps you out and work those few months or weeks into your itinerary. And uh, fair chance, we might see you down here over those times. Okay, so tip number four is high country rivers. Now, as beautiful as these things are, don't ever underestimate the power of water flow because these things will destroy a full drive in a heartbeat if you get it wrong. And that's one thing with the Victorian high country that's so well known for, apart from its amazing tracks and beautiful views, the high country is absolutely loaded with river systems and they all join up and meet up somewhere along the line. So you gotta be really, really careful when you do cross these things. Like for example, if you were to do a trip from say Mansfield through to Dargo, on a trip like that, depending on which way you go, you'd be doing in excess of around 40 river crossings. Now that's a stack of crossings to do in one trip. And where you've got to be really careful when you're doing a lot of crossings like that, is you've got to keep an eye on the weather. Because if it rains, these things can rise really, really quickly, and that's where you've got to be super careful when crossing over them. But there's a couple of also things to keep in mind when it comes to the weather. It doesn't have to rain where you're camping for these to rise. So, you know, you could get a lot of rain further upstream, and the river systems, as I say, they all join up and meet. They all rise, and, and you've got to be very, very careful. But there's a couple of sure signs to keep an eye on where you can see what's going on upstream. I mean, these things don't talk to you, but they'll certainly show you what's going on if you know what to look out for. And the things to look out for are these things, the river systems are generally pretty clear and clean most of the time of the year. But if they start getting that dirty, muddy sort of a look about them, and you know there's been some storms in the area, there's a fair chance there's been a stack of rain further upstream, and these things will rise really, really quickly in situations like that. So if you're going forward in a trip and continuing on, you've got to be super careful with going forward, knowing there's more crossings you're going to do, and the rivers are already starting to change colour, you've got to be really careful on those sort of things. So keep that little tip in mind for your next trip, and look out for those rivers if they start changing colour. Okay, so tip number five. This is what I call the game changing conditions. And what do I mean by that? Look, I've already spoken a little bit about the rain, how that can affect the river systems and that sort of thing. But there's something else you've really got to take into account and that's on the extreme windy days. So if you were doing a trip through the high country, you know you're going from one day through to the next and you get one of these really extreme windy days, You've got to decide whether you base camp up for one more day and see what the next day brings, or you chance it and drive through. For me, there's no way known I'd be driving anywhere in the Victorian high country on those really windy days. It's just far too dangerous, the fair chance trees coming down. And one thing with the high country, there's no shortage of trees here. There's also a couple of areas you've got to take into account on those really windy days. And so I call them the grey timber areas. There's a few of them around. There's one of them out of Mansfield here. When you drive up through number three track, there's a lot of grey timber up through there. And if you're heading up towards sort of Lovick's Hut and Bluff Hut, as you start the track, there's a lot of grey timber there. And if you've been over around Dargo and up around Blue Rag Range track and those kind of areas, there's a stack of the grey timber trees up through there. And what they are, they're trees that have been burnt through the Victorian high country fires over the years. And you've got to be really careful because those trees are dead and they're just sticks pretty much standing in the ground. And on those really windy days, they can fall really, really easily. So take that into your account. Do you park up for another day or do you take a chance? For me, I'd be parking up every day of the week. Okay, so tip number six. I'm gonna list all the items that I bring on every single time when I go out into the high country. Doesn't matter what time of year it is. So we'll get into it. But I'm gonna start here first. Look, even though this is a fixed item, so it's on the car all the time, but I would say a snorkel is an absolute must. If you wanna have a good look around the Victorian high country, because of the amount of river crossings you're gonna to have to do, these are an absolute necessity. So make sure you get a snorkel, fit it to your full drive. So here's a lineup of the gear that I bring in my full drive on every time I head out into the Victorian high country. So we'll go in through them, each of them step by step and I'll show you all the bits and pieces that I bring along on every trip. And I pack this gear before I do food, uh, clothing, anything like that. This is all my necessities that come with me on every single trip, doesn't matter what time of the year it is. So, we'll get into it, eh? 
Okay, we'll start at the beginning here. Look, this is no sort of certain order on when I packed all, all these bits and pieces, but these are just all the items that I do bring on every single trip. So I'll start with a really good quality toolbox. So it's got all the spanners there, sockets and, you know, Allen keys and that sort of thing. Fit pretty much you know, all the nuts and bolts on, on my full drive or even someone else's full drive. So good quality toolbox. Highly recommend getting one of those. Uh, log splitter, that's great for speeding up firewood and things like that when you get to camp. A uh, little axe here, that's really handy, you know, for getting cutting up, speeding up kindling, you know, to get your fire started. A good old fashioned bow saw, you can't go too wrong with carrying one of those either. Don't carry much, you know, not a lot of weight involved, so we'll take up much room, so well worth grabbing one of those. Um, and then the long handled shovel, well, there's a lot of uses for one of those, whether you dig yourself out, if you get into a bog or that sort of thing, or you might have to clear a fire pit out. But also, really handy, if you're not camping anywhere where there's a drop toilet, if you've got to go out in the bush and, and uh, dig a toilet, you're going to need a shovel. So make sure you've got a shovel for that sort of application. <laughs> okay, so this is all the gear that I've got now for pumping up my tyres and deflating my tyres, because it's certainly a big part of full driving and something you should do every time when you go out, out in the bush full driving. So I've got a good quality air compressor and I've got a tyre gauge there as well. Um, so I can use that for you know checking my tyre pressures and, and that sort of thing. Um, then I've got the easy deflator here. These are just fantastic for um, letting your tyres down really quickly. So I highly recommend. Make sure you have a good setup for pumping up your tyres and letting your tyres back down again. Righto, we'll move along to the next couple of items. Okay, so the next items that I keep in my patrol every time when I go out in the bush are certainly a good, good quality pair of gloves for those cold days, especially during the snow season. Get plenty of use out of those. Uh, the trusty old dryser bone, you can't go wrong with one of those. Uh, three quarter length, and that certainly keeps me nice and dry, you know, for out in the rain and those sort of things. Um, and then the other items, certainly my hat and dryser bone vest. Can't go past without taking these on every single trip. Uh, get into some of the safety items that I certainly take away with me. Um, and I've had this snake bite kit here. This is purpose designed kit for snake bites and spider bites. And they're certainly something you need to take into account for if you're down here during those summer months, particularly with snakes and things. So this is a really, really good kit for that, that kind of thing if someone does get bitten by a snake. And if one thing with your first aid boxes that someone should have in every single one of your first aid box is these special designed um, bandages for uh, snake bites. So and what they're designed for, if you can see the rectangles on that bandage, as you stretch it out when you're applying the tension around the limb, whether it be the arm or the leg, those rectangles turn into a square shape. So that gives you the indication that you're applying the right tension because it's really, really important that that tension is correct. So really worth having one of those in your, in your first aid kit. Now I've got two in this specially designed kit here. In case you've got to do a leg because you know one might not be long enough. So at least have one or maybe get a couple of those. Highly recommend that kind of bandage. Uh, then I'll get into the safety devices here. Um, this is a personal location beacon. Um, GPS operated, so if I locate this or set it off, this will be within an accurate radius of about 50 metres from where I am, which is really handy. Uh, and there's not a matter of if someone's going to come if I let this, if I start this up, it's a matter of when. So people will definitely come. So I highly recommend something like that. And it's small and compact. Uh, I can slide it around my belt so I can carry it with me anywhere I go. So really, really handy having one of those. And same with that little first aid kit, you know, I can pack that anywhere. It's only small. So I can take that anywhere as well. And then this first aid box here, that's just, just sort of a general first aid box, you know, with some bandages and a few other things like that, headache tablets and things. But that is the main one that I certainly like to have with the snake bites and that sort of thing. And then with the jerry can here, um, I don't always carry spare fuel, just depends on how far I'm going, because I mean, the patrol's got 120 litres in it from standard. But, you know, if I'm doing a, a longer trip for three or four days, I'll always take a jerry can. Might not use it, but I'd rather have plenty than go looking for it. So, always take a jerry can. Well, we'll move on to the next ones and see what we've got down the back here. <laughs> okay, so now we get into the chainsaw gear that I take on every single time, and you should always bring at least one chainsaw uh, every time you come out here, because the amount of trees that can fall down, you might have to cut your way through to get to the next camp spot or something like that, or even just really handy, you know, for cutting up timber for firewood. So I've got my chaps there, which really should everyone should wear, wear a set of these when you're cutting up firewood, because if your chain ever breaks, these are going to make sure that your legs don't get cut to pieces. Uh, spare fuel, uh, chain oil and two-stroke oil, carry all those sort of things. 
Um, and this is another thing that I've recently gone and gone, oh, probably 12 months ago now. But I went and did a chainsaw course. You know, I've been using a chainsaw for years and don't ever think you know anything about these. And they're, they're a tool that you should never ever become sort of complacent with because they're a very, very dangerous sort of item. But after doing this chainsaw course, and I highly recommend you go and do it, it's just amazing the little little tips and tricks that you sort of learn with cutting techniques and maintenance and that sort of thing. So I highly recommend go and do a chainsaw course. It's an absolutely fantastic course. Um, and same with the first aid, you know, I'm P first aid certified with uh, your first aid boxes and make sure that you know how to use it. It's always good having that sort of stuff, but it's really handy if you know how to use it properly. So those couple of courses are well worth going to do. And then to finish it off, this is a must have item. You can have a couple of stubby holders for a couple of cold beverages at the end of the day while you're sitting around the campfire. So that's my lineup and uh, these things come with every single trip. So I uh, hope those little tips help you out and uh, see how you compare with the items that you take on every single trip on, that you go on. Good on you guys. So tip number seven, you wanna always be very careful where you go setting your swag and your camp up, particularly around where there's a lot of trees and there's plenty of trees in the Victorian high country because you get situations like this where big branches can fall and it doesn't have to be windy for these sort of branches to fall, fall from the trees up above. So make sure before you go setting your camp up, have a bit of a look up above I know it's going to be a bit hard sometimes because of the amount of trees around but you can at least try and eliminate some of the dangers by seeing how healthy the branches are up above you. The Victorian high country. It is a beautiful place and it's well worth coming down here to check it out. It covers a massive area and the weather, well it can change down here at any time and without notice. So you do need to be prepared for that. And I hope some of the tips in this video have helped you out for your next four wheel drive camping adventure into the area. And if you've got any further questions, please don't hesitate to contact me. But in the meantime, I look forward to seeing you guys on another one of Tim Bates' four wheel drive adventures.